Let us pray. For the gift of your saints, O Lord, we give you praise, that you have given us examples in them of the great blessings that you provide us, blessings of faith and life. Let us not despise the path of following your Son, no matter the cross we may bear, but instead cause us to see it as a blessing, for in it we are joined to the life and death and resurrection of our Savior Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Dear fellow redeemed, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for our meditation this morning is the gospel appointed for the feast of St. John the Apostle and Evangelist from the gospel according to St. John, the 21st chapter, beginning at the 19th verse. Please rise in Jesus' name. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. After saying this, he told him, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple Jesus loved following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and asked, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked Jesus, Lord, what about him? If I want him to remain until I come, Jesus answered, what is that to you? You follow me. And so it was said among the brothers that this disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say that he would not die, but if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is testifying about these things and who wrote these things. We know that his testimony is true. These are your words, Heavenly Father. Sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Merry Christmas. Again, as I said, this festival lasts 12 days as the song sings. And each day as that popular song sings, we receive multiplied gifts upon gifts. December 25th, the first day of Christmas, the day of Jesus' birth. But the rest of the 12 days are also packed with significance. Someone has said that Christmas is for martyrs. And you can see that in the second, third, and fourth days of Christmas. December 26th is the second day of Christmas, and it's St. Stephen's Day. A martyr for the Lord in will and in deed, stoned to death by the ruling Jews as he proclaimed the gospel. And he turned hearts to his Lord and Savior when he said, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Today, December 27th, is the third day of Christmas in the feast of St. John the Apostle, a martyr for the Lord in will, but not in deed. In fact, of the apostles who remained after Judas, John was the only one who was not killed for the faith. But instead, he died of old age in exile on an island called Patmos, where he received visions from the Lord and wrote the book of Revelation, as well as his letters and gospel. And tomorrow, December 28th, is the fourth day of Christmas, and that rounds out that trio with the Feast of the Holy Innocents, the babies in Bethlehem who were killed by Herod, martyrs for the Lord in deed, but not in will. Their deaths and the blood that ran through that sleepy town testified to the birth of Christ and who he truly was. His blood would sanctify theirs bringing comfort to the weeping eyes of the mothers and fathers who lost their children. See, yes, Christmas is indeed for martyrs. Martyr is a word itself that means witness, as in one who gives testimony in a court of law. So we hear of St. John in our Gospel text, this is the disciple who is testifying about these things and who wrote these things. We know that his testimony is true. God used the death of St. Stephen, the slaughter of the innocents, and the life of St. John all to testify to the truth of the gospel, which is the reason and purpose for the feast of the Nativity, or for Christmas. Jesus Christ was born, you see, to shed his blood for you and for me. And so because we know that this gospel is true, we follow Jesus in life, and death. Peter was told he would die. Jesus used these words, Amen, Amen, I tell you, when you were young, you dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, 
and someone else will tie you and carry you where you do not want to go. This is what signified the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Specifically, Peter was crucified in Rome. There are particulars about that death, though. He felt unworthy to die in the same way that his Lord had died, and so he begged to be crucified upside down. So an upside-down cross is a symbol commonly used for St. Peter. And therefore, see how by this apostle's death, he glorified God. He put the focus away from himself and instead on Jesus. He died for Jesus in that way. And St. John, as I said, did not suffer a martyr's death, but instead he suffered a martyr's life. He lived for Jesus. The youngest of the apostles lived to the greatest age. He was in his early 90s when he died, somewhere around the turn of the first Christian century. But only St. Paul wrote more of the New Testament. John wrote three epistles, the book of Revelation and the gospel which bears his name. In all these works, John was keen to demonstrate the truth of Jesus, that he was indeed God in the flesh. The first 14 verses of John's Gospel are traditionally read in the morning of Christmas Day, and they state, The Word became flesh and dwelled among us. We have seen His glory, the glory He has as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. The other three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, had been written by the time John wrote his, and so he spent his life's work filling in the gaps, so to speak. His gospel is traditionally depicted by the figure of an eagle because his gospel soars high above the other three. And no one can deny that John's writing style is magnificent, beautiful, and poetic, and deep. And yet it's also so very simple. In fact, John's gospel is typically used in introductory Greek translation classes. John shared Jesus through his life, letting his own life be a presentation of his Savior. John's students would share how John would refer to those he taught the gospel as his beloved children. We have examples of that in his writing, too, as he says in his first epistle, My children, I write these things to you. He had such an earnest desire to share the joy and light and love of Jesus with those he met. And Jesus had told Peter, Feed my lambs. And John took that to heart as well. On that Christmas day, God was born a little child in order to purchase by his blood the lives of all people to make us his little children. So when St. John looked at another person, he saw someone for whom Christ died. Someone that his Lord wished to have as his own dear child. So he followed Jesus. No doubt he did desire to die for the faith, as this also would have been a great witness, and it would have meant that he could see his Lord again all the sooner. But that wasn't the Lord's plan for him. Instead, God used him to care for his dear children, to share a witness that we can hold as absolutely true. We've heard in the gospel how we know that his testimony is true. And he wrote in one letter, I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. And in his revelation, he writes, Christ expressed this revelation by means of symbols sent through his angel to his servant John. John spoke as a witness to the word of God and to the testimony about Jesus Christ, that is, to everything he saw. And the angel who guided John through these visions stated all near the end of this whole vision, these words are faithful and true. So see how God uses both death and life to serve his church. We know the comfort of that passage which tells us, we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. And that means whether we live or whether we die, and however much pain or ease accompanies either of these, God uses it all to bring about our redemption and the redemption of others. St. Peter and St. John both demonstrated this attitude. Peter, with his death, wished to glorify God, thereby saving others. 
And John, with his life, also glorified God, saving still more. We see the lives and deaths of these saints, and we can learn much from them. But especially what we can learn is that we can also follow Jesus if others live or die. St. Paul wrote to the Philippians, Yes, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I am to go on living in the flesh, that will mean fruitful labor for me. And which should I prefer? I do not know. I am pulled in two directions because I have the desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for your sake that I remain in the flesh. And since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. The pattern of life that other saints in Christ are blessed with might seem enviable. How much better, John might have thought, wouldn't it be if I had died like Peter? Or how much better, Peter might have hoped, couldn't it be if I could live to the time of Jesus' coming? Peter asked Jesus, Lord, what about him? I don't know what was in his heart when he asked. Children who receive Christmas presents are known to eye like vultures, the presents that others open. That might have been Peter's attitude, or it might have been just mere curiosity or care for his fellow apostle. I don't know. But whatever the case, Jesus dismissed him. If I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Booker T. Washington gave a speech in 1895 in which he spoke the following parable. A ship lost at sea for many days suddenly sighted a friendly vessel. From the mast of the unfortunate vessel was seen a signal, Water, water, we die of thirst. The answer from the friendly vessel at once came back, Cast down your bucket where you are. A second time the signal, Water, send us water, ran up from the distressed vessel and was answered, Cast down your bucket where you are. A third and fourth signal for water was answered. Cast down your bucket where you are. The captain of the distressed vessel, at last heeding the injunction, cast down his bucket, and it came up full of fresh, sparkling water from the mouth of the Amazon River. Now, his speech was about civil rights following the Civil War, but there's something we can learn from his belief that people should make the most of any situation they find themselves in. In fact, speaking as Christians, it's simpler than that. St. Luke records in his gospel how Jesus encouraged his disciples to face all the suffering that was going to come upon them. He said, so make up your minds not to prepare beforehand how to defend yourselves, for I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. Now, this is the truth and the comfort that we have. Suffering will come. I don't know exactly what it will look like for each individual person, whether it will be in life or in death, but there will be persecution, temptation, fire, all coming from the devil, from the world, and even from our own sinful flesh. We can't handle it. We can't bear it. There's no way our faith would survive what comes to us if it were up to us to maintain it. St. Peter, writing in the Holy Spirit, shared how we are able to endure it. He said, but even if you should happen to suffer because of righteousness, you are blessed. Do not be afraid of what they fear, and do not be troubled, but regard the Lord the Christ as holy in your hearts. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that is in you, but speak with gentleness and respect while maintaining a clear conscience so that those who attack your good way of life in Christ may be put to shame because they slandered you as evildoers. Indeed, it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil, because Christ also suffered once for sins in our place, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in flesh, but was made alive in spirit. There are answers that we will seek but will not be given throughout our life. Why hasn't God taken me home yet? Why is God taking me home now? I'm not ready. But even in these questions, which I do encourage you to cry out to God in your prayers, 
in your devotions, on your bed at night when you can't sleep, during the day when you can't stay awake. Cry out to him like the psalmist, I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears, I drench my couch with my weeping. Even in these questions, the gospel gives you the life that Jesus won. It's the gospel that gives the life and death of every Christian meaning. The gospel that Jesus died, that Jesus rose, and that he did it for you. And that gospel is given to you in the word, in baptism, and in the sacrament of the altar. These are the means God has chosen to channel to you the blessings of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. You have that resurrection, that eternal life. So for a Christian now, every cross we bear means redemption. Because the empty tomb is beyond the cross. And therefore this gospel gives us the ability to follow Jesus. And it does this because we know it is true. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, forevermore. Amen.